Um, so I'll just go ahead and introduce myself. So basically, I got diagnosed last year in 2019, and I started methotrexate after sulfasalazine was not helping me at all. I started out with pills, and then I ended up needing some injections because the pills were giving me a lot of side effects. So that's kind of what my journey has been. I got off of it two months ago because I needed a live vaccination for chickenpox. And that's two doses, and they have to all be a month apart. Um, so I'm getting back on it again on the 15th, and I'm very nervous and scared. So I'm hoping that this will also help me be more brave when we restart. Um, Cheryl, did you want to go ahead and introduce yourself next? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Cheryl Crow. I've had rheumatoid arthritis for 17 or 18 years, depending on the math. I can't remember. And um, I, ha I live in the Seattle area and I've been um, on methotrexate for, for the whole 17 years, except for when I was um, planning on getting pregnant. And then for a couple of years after we weren't sure if we were going to try for another baby. So methotrexate is one of those meds that you don't want to take when you're pregnant. So, um, but I'm excited to share my journey with everybody. I'll happily go next. Hi, Paulina. Hey guys, girls. <laughs> um, so I will just say that my name is Paulina because no one here knows. I'm 23 and I was diagnosed with arthritis at the age of 18. So I have had it for four or five years. Maths is very great right now. Um, and I started off with, I don't know if I should say this now, but I will anyway. I started off with the pills and now I'm on the injections, but correct me if I'm wrong, I shouldn't get into too much details now, we'll do that later. <laughs> um, but, right, cool. So yeah, so I started off with the pills and now I'm on the injections and there was a very sort of strange journey in between, which I'm very excited to share with you all. Yeah, full stop. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kristen. I am 33. I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis and Sjogren's syndrome two years ago, and I started on methotrexate, the oral form, two days after I was diagnosed, and I've been on it ever since, and I'm still in the oral format, so. Oh, that's a really quick turnaround for them to give you medications. Yeah, my rheumatologist moves incredibly fast, which is one of the reasons why I love her so much. I think that I've saved a lot of permanent joint damage because of her. So Yay. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Joe, would you like to go next? Um, sure. So hi, I'm Joe. Um, I'm a master's student in Leeds in the UK. Uh, I'm 22 and I was diagnosed when I was 19, uh, but I didn't go on the metotrexate until I was 20. Uh, but I will go into that a bit later on. Um, and my fun fact is that in my free time, I like to veganize everything that I used to love uh, before I went plant-based. Uh, I'm just doing it my own way. So, yeah. I love that. Yay. Thank you for sharing. Hi, um, I'm Ananthi. I am 34. And I am in a small market town, not far from London in the UK. Um, I was diagnosed officially two weeks ago and was started on methotrexate on the day. So um, I waited until the weekend, but we'll get onto that later. Yes, I have officially had two doses of methotrexate so far, so I'm a newbie. <laughs> Welcome, so excited. I hope this will help you um, get with your journey and everything from here on out. I'm so excited. Definitely. <laughs> Jennifer? Hi, I'm Jenny. Um, I am from the US 
and I was diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis in November. Um, I was going to start methotrexate two weeks ago, but I got some type of infection. So I'm kind of waiting to get the clearance on starting it in the next couple of weeks. So I am also a newbie. Yay. <laughs> Are we? Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Hey, I'm Allie. Um, I live in the United States. I currently live in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I just turned 27 two days ago, um, and I got diagnosed at the age of 15 with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And I started methotrexate back in 2016. Um, and I was on it for about two years, and then I thought I was in remission, went off it about four months, and then had to go right back on it again. <laughs> and I am currently on it, um, and that's me. Yay, welcome. Thank you guys so much for sharing. Just, I think everyone introduced themselves. Yay, all right. So um, next we'll go ahead and start talking about how our journey with methotrexate has been. Um, anyone that hasn't tried methotrexate yet or is just beginning to, do you guys have any fears you would like to share that maybe we can clear up for you guys? Um, we can say like, and we can take turns saying how we were all put on it as well, if you guys would like. Awesome, okay, um, who would like to go first, anybody? I'll happily go first. Okay, yay, go ahead. <laughs> um, right, so my journey into methotrexate has been a pretty funny one, I would like to say, because it was influenced by my silly actions. Um, right, so what happened was I was 18, and one morning I woke up feeling like a completely different person and not in a good way. Um, and ever since that morning, I mean, I started going to the doctors. I was living in England at that time. Now I'm living in Germany. And went to my GP, which then took a very long time, probably around a year to actually end up at my rheumatoid specialist in England, which I saw her. And I can't say that I had a super great experience because it felt very... It felt very like a tick list. Like I was just one of those people that she was seeing coming through the doors in and out. And she didn't listen to my full story. She was just like, here, here's a stick man. Where does it hurt? Okay, cool. We'll do an injection here. And uh, we'll give you these pills and start the steroids. So what happened in the beginning was I had a steroid injection into my whole body, as in like one into my bum because my whole body was very bad. Um, but it didn't do anything. So she started me on the prednisone on the pills. So I was on that for, I think, a good month or even longer while I was starting my methotrexate, which was also in the pill form. To sort of wait for the methotrexate to kick in, I had to be on the steroids to actually be able to function. Um, and yeah, so then I slowly started easing off the prednisone because you have to ease off of it and not come off of it drastically, or at least that's what I have been always been told. Um, I then immediately, as soon as I was officially diagnosed and put on this medication, and I was told that this is not curable, and I was told that I'm going to have to take this for the rest of my life, I was like, hold on a minute. Yeah. If I am going to be destroying my body, I mean, helping and destroying it at the same time with this medication, then I'm pretty sure there's something natural that I can do to help my body fight it or at least help it a little bit more. So I started going to my uncle Google and spending tons of hours of just Googling, researching, just forums or things like that but I didn't have a community to turn to like we we are so lucky that we have that now at that point I didn't know anyone who had it no one in my family has ever experienced something like this it was also new for my family to 
um, to like adapt, I guess, because I was still living with my parents and luckily that I was because without them, I honestly wouldn't be able to do anything. Um, so it was such a big like adaptation for all of us. And because all of my Google searches started showing, yeah, like you need to go on this anti-inflammatory diet and maybe try this and maybe try that. I started experimenting with everything and I went on a lot of vitamin supplements. I started doing a lot of different vitamin and nutrition changes in my body. And as we know, it's different for everyone. So it's not like this is the diet you follow and it's definitely going to help. Um, so yeah, so I just started doing a lot of things by myself. I had three, every three months I had a check-in with my specialist. And I think after six months of being on the medication, I honestly, I changed my diet like extremely. I was someone who was very, very fussy with her eating. I would not for example, at that time I was still eating meat and I was so fussy that I wouldn't even eat meat on the bone because I was like, no, I can't do that. I need to eat it differently. And I changed from being super fussy to actually experimenting with vegetables and fruits and vitamins. So the change was super drastic for me. I never ate unhealthy, but I never really focused on what I was eating. Um, and anyways, for me, it helped being on a very high dosage of methotrexate. I think I started off on like 25 or even higher. And I was on steroids for the first couple of months. Um, I went to my specialist and then after I left her room where I literally didn't get much support, I was just like, do you know what? I feel fine now. I don't have any pain. I'm doing this diet stuff. I'm just going to like throw the medication out. And that's what I did. So overnight, I stopped taking my medication and I was very, very confident in myself that my diet is going to get me there and I'm going to do it all. And you know what? I was fine for two years. I was okay. So I actually was very lucky that that's what happened because I mean, it could have been much worse. Um, and then after that duration of two years, I decided to move countries and I moved to Germany. I moved to Germany and I think I was here for, for two weeks and I had my massive flare up again in a country that I don't know the language of, don't know any people. I don't, I mean, I had my partner here, so obviously it was very helpful. But our relationship was also very new and we were only together for like five months or four months, I think. So it was like, great, I just came to move in with you and live and create a life. And here I am sitting on my bed. I can't even do anything by myself. Um, however, I consider myself once again in this situation, actually extremely lucky that I ended up in Germany, in Munich when this happened and the flare up probably happened because there was a lot of change in my life happening. There was a lot of stress, a lot of new experiences and my body definitely felt it. Mm -hmm. um, and luckily Munich where I am, I've had amazing experiences with doctors here. I went to a, Oh gosh, don't know the scientific name, but like the doctor who looks after bones and all of these things, because that was one that my partner was already seeing. So he kind of knew him and I managed to get into him quicker. He saw me and he was like, oh, okay, well, we know you have arthritis. So you actually need to see this specialist, but you can't go to see that specialist without a referral from a different doctor. Um, and he was, I'm so grateful for him because what he actually did, it was on the same day as I was in his cabinet, he called his specialist arthritis friend, doctor, which was fully booked if I wanted to actually go to her myself. And he managed to get me an appointment two days after seeing him. And I was like completely shocked that that was happening so fast. I went to see her. Um, and she is like the best I could wish for or the best I've experienced in my uh, past experiences with other doctors. She, 
Mm-hmm. She looked at my symptoms. She fully listened to everything I had to say. I could sit there as long as I wanted and talk to her. She examined all parts of the body that were achy and felt them and did ultrasound, uh, ultra scans and all of these different things. And then she put me on methotrexate again, but on the injection form. And in England, no one even told me that injection form of methotrexate existed. So I was like, oh, okay. And obviously for me, I mean, anyways, um, I felt that injections was something that I felt more comfortable with as much as an injection does. Um, and with the pills, now that I have a comparison, I've been on the injections for like two and a half years. I don't have that many side effects as I used to with the pills. With the pills, I, ex- I experienced a lot more hair loss. I still experience it a little bit now, but with the pills, I experienced it much more. Um, and I was very fatigued. In the injection form, I still feel that, but um, but I don't feel it as much. Okay, yes, that's true. Um, yes, so, um, oh, sorry, I got distracted with the comments now. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't know if I'm speaking too much or whatever, but I'll just uh, continue. Um, <laughs> Right. So, yeah. So then she examined me and she put me on methotrexate injections, which so far I've had a really good experience with. I started off at a really high dosage again, but now I'm back and I'm slowly coming off of it. And I'm on from 25 to from starting at 25, I'm now down to 7.5 and I'm slowly decreasing it. Um, so far it's going well. I haven't been able to decrease it much more because the winter here was actually a lot longer than usual and that affected my joints. I was a little bit worried to take me off of it uh, because we, I mean, for me, my, the weather impacts me quite a lot actually and the cold weather especially. So yeah, so far, so good. I've Still experimenting with diet and exercise and movement is very helpful for me, but this is just my own experience. I mean, every one of us is so different. Every one of us experiences things in such a different way um, that we can just talk about what's helped each one of us. But I don't know, did I miss anything? Does anyone have any questions? Uh, Maybe I didn't go into enough detail about something or I (laughs) Thank you. <laughs> no, I love how you also talked about the side effects. So from here on, we're just combining the two questions. That way we can all just have this organic dis- discussion. I love how like your doctor's experience has been totally different in Germany versus when you were in England. And I'm happy you got to move there. Yay. Mm-hmm. Um does anybody else also like prefer pills over, or I mean injections over pills? Because um, what do you think, Shara? How do you feel? Have you have you tried both also? Yeah, yeah. I was initially put on pills, and I did them for a long time because I liked the convenience. Mm-hmm. Um, it's funny because when I'm speaking, my face doesn't come into the middle, but when anyone else does, it does. Anyway, I'll just edit that out. It's just weird. Do you guys see my face coming into the middle of the screen when I'm talking? You do. Mm -hmm. Okay. It must have to be just to do with if you're the speaker. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, after, um, I had my son, which was 11 years after my diagnosis, um, my body changed like in a lot of ways. Um, so I became, my stomach became more sensitive. And so I noticed that I was just slightly feeling nauseous. So I, my doctor suggested doing the injection to be easier on my stomach. So I, I prefer that, but, um, yeah, I I have no needle phobia. I know for some people, the needle phobia makes it hard to do the injections. Yeah. Thank you. Um, did you want to go ahead and share how you were first put on the meds? Yeah. So what's funny is most of my stories for my journey of rheumatoid arthritis are really long. Like my diagnosis saga, I call it a saga because it was really, really long and painful. Um, But like my journey with methotrexate was really like 
quick because I was diagnosed, okay, when, at, at the age of 20 in 2003. So there was no Facebook, there was no Instagram, there was nothing like Facebook was literally being developed at Harvard at the time. So they're just, it's really hard, I think, for younger people to imagine that you would get a diagnosis and you just listen to your doctor. <laughs> like there was no sort of like, I mean, of course you would look at the side effects on the little thing from Walgreens, but I literally, I have a lot of really vivid memories from that time. I have no memory of any concern about methotrexate because um, for me, I had been in so much pain physically and emotionally for years. And then I finally had a doctor that was listening to me and told me this thing can give you relief. Yeah, it might have some side effects, but the evidence says that this is the most likely thing to give you relief. And I was like, uh, yes, give it to me now. Like I will pay you a thousand dollars for this, you know, and they're like, so, and it's been really fascinating. I didn't, and I'm just lucky that I don't experience a lot of the side effects other people do. I'm actually on 25 milligrams of methotrexate now. I've slowly climbed up over the years from like 10 to um, 25 again. I didn't have to go up that high until after my son. Um, I don't want to scare people who want to have kids. Lots of people with RA can have kids and my, my condition's pretty well controlled now, but it was, it was dicey for a little while. And so I had to try, we had to try lots of different things. It was like whack-a-mole. So, um, but you know, and I, I have to say I have a little bit of tiredness afterwards, but I know a lot of people talk about the dreaded methotrexate hangover. And I literally had, didn't hear about that until like the late two thousands when I was on social media, I was like, why do people keep talking about the methotrexate hangover? I'm like, are they talking? I actually took it literal because I thought that they meant because you're not supposed to drink when you're on methotrexate, you're not supposed to drink alcohol. So I thought, oh, they like are having a hangover because they accidentally like drunk alcohol while they were on methotrexate. But actually, no, they're talking about fatigue. So, um, so yeah, I did not have any fear about it. Um, I was like purely just relieved to have an option. And um, it, again, if I mean, this is like really nerdy, but if you look into the history of, method, of rheumatoid arthritis treatment, like the late 90s and early 2000s is right when they had first come out with the biologics. So the rheumatologist went from like, we barely have anything for you to like, we, they are like excited. Like the rheumatologists are like, we have these amazing meds that can like change your life and like change the trajectory of the disease so that you don't have like guaranteed permanent joint deformities. And so I was like, sure, sign me up. So, you know, um, um, and I, I, I know we were going to talk a little bit about, yeah, um, advice for injections. Just real quick in general, my advice for injections is um, to go quicker. It's kind of like ripping the Band-Aid. So the faster you go, the less it hurts. Definitely when I had those, I mean, I don't have a needle phobia, but I, it was still hard. It was a learning curve to learn it. And sometimes I still am like a little bit like, er, oh, uh, yeah, oh, I'm not going to go very fast. And then it's like hurts way more. So just, just go for it. And um, I like control, so I prefer to do it myself. I wouldn't want someone else doing it for me, but I still, everyone's different. Um, but yeah, that's my journey. Any, any questions about that? Yay, thank you so much for sharing, Cheryl. You're I just, welcome. Your journey has been really long, so it's really good to hear over the years how you're, you have you know, found ways to control your disease and have your body do whatever you want it to do, you know, sometimes you do have to succumb to your illness, but I think mm -hmm. for the most part, you are always such a bright, positive energy. So <laughs> thank you for sharing. Thank you. Um, is there any questions, guys, for Cheryl? Um, no question from me, but I'd love to just add on top of that about the injection tip. I have the same. I, in the beginning, when I was first put onto it, the nurse had to do the first injection to show me and that was scaring me more than what I'm doing now however even now I'm like three two one and then I close my eyes and I do it and even though I've been doing it every single week for the past two and a half years and actually what bothers me more and I mentioned it on my Instagram the other day or was it yesterday or today um that I actually what makes me feel nauseous is the smell of the antiseptic wipe <laughs> than the actual injection itself which is very funny so i don't agree when i'm doing it because it just makes me feel <laughs> oh my gosh i totally agree i think you end up making these connections in your brains to 
I don't know, yellow pills for me is it. Um, like any circular pills, I hate them all now. And I, I didn't even have a pill phobia. I would be able to swallow eight of them at a time. I did 12 one time when I was taking them as a Trexate pills. Now I do one at a time. It's just, I, I my self salazine now is super huge. I just don't know why they make them so inconvenient. I know, a quick, a quick tip for pills, and I don't know how I figured this out, but if you take a really deep breath before swallowing it, it goes a lot better. I have no idea why that is. Or, um, I mean, you could always ask the pharmacist whether it's the kind of pill that you can, you know, cut into with a pill cutter or grind. Oh, it's not sulfas. Sulfas are known for being some of them, yeah, harder. But taking that deep breath, it's almost like, I don't know if it opens your throat up or something, but it's a, it's what I've done when I had to take the prenatal vitamins, which are also notoriously huge. <laughs> they are enormous. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you guys um, for chiming in. Ali, did you want to tell us your journey with methotrexate? Yeah. So like Cheryl, my journey is really long, so I'll try to make it short. Um, so I didn't go on methotrexate when I got diagnosed. So I got diagnosed. I had MRIs. I had my knee drained uh, three times, and then I had arthroscopic knee surgery in my right knee. And they went in there and they took all the gunk out is what I call it. And um, I had like a tumor in there. And so they took that out and they, you know, it was a benign tumor, but they took it out and they tested it and they said it was rheumatoid arthritis. And this was back in Saudi Arabia, which is where I was living at the time. It's where I grew up. And um, funny, actually, they couldn't find it in Connecticut. They didn't see the tumor. They didn't see anything wrong. <laughs> so I actually got diagnosed in Saudi Arabia. Um, and then, so that was back in 2009. And I was actually good for six years after that. So no medication, nothing. The surgery did really well. Uh, the surgeon actually said, you're probably gonna be good for five to six years, but then it's gonna come back. And he was like spot on. So six years later, it came back and I got my knee drained. And then after that, I was fine. And then fast forward a year later, it all came back in like full force. So my knee uh, got inflamed and I had to get it drained. And I was in denial that I had RA because it was only in one joint. I had it nowhere else, just my right knee. And so because of this, I went to every single doctor you could go to. I went to different countries. I went to um, Italy, Saudi Arabia, and the States. <laughs> um, I saw doctors in Florida, um, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. And that was in a span of seven weeks. And every single week I had to get my knee drained. Um, so for seven weeks, I was either on crutches, a cane or a wheelchair. And this was back in, um, 2015 to going into 2016. So by the seventh week, my doctor in Florida was like, you know what, if you get it drained one more time, this will be your eighth time in the past seven weeks. And you're at super risk for infection. You can't do that anymore. You're gonna have to go on methotrexate. And at that point I was like, fine, whatever, I'm done. Like I can't walk. I got tested for Lyme disease. I got tested for everything and everything came back negative. My knee got so bad within that seven week period that they were like, you're gonna have to have surgery again because there was just a lot of buildup over the years. Um, and so I went on methotrexate back in 2016, I gave in. And um, like Cheryl, I didn't have um, social media at the time. I mean, I did, but it wasn't like I have now where I've met all of you. So I didn't know a single person with RA. Um, I joined a group on Facebook and it was all ladies in their 70s. <laughs> and it made me so depressed and it was awful. And they were telling me that the methotrexate is going to kill me. Um, it was just a mess. And so, um, and no one in my family has it. I'm the only one. And so it was really hard for me. And when the doctor gave me the pills, like Cheryl said, I was just like, all right, like pills. Like I had a pamphlet <laughs> and um, I read it and I didn't even know it was a form of chemotherapy at the time. Like I was just like, all right, the doctor gave me these pills. I'm going to take it. And so um, I took it and uh, my mom was with me at the time and I was feeling really sick. I just remember being super sick for the first two months and not really knowing why. I just thought whatever, it's my RA. And so it, it wasn't until like uh, two years later and within those two years I had surgery again. And I was on it for two years and then I was like, I'm going to make an account because I just need to meet people that are going through this because I feel like this is hell and I <laughs> can't do it anymore. So I made the account and I met a ton of people who were on methotrexate and I learned it was a chemotherapy and I realized why I was having the hangover. 
Um, and I'm on the pills. I stuck to the pills the whole time. I never did any infections. One, because I didn't even know that was a thing. <laughs> and um, two, um, I handle the pills really well. I do get a hangover. I'm actually having one right now. I took mine last night. And um, I've always been on 10 pills this entire time. So uh, 25 milligrams. And um, my doctor was like, if you handle the pills quite well, then you don't really need to do injections. Like you can if you want, but right now you don't have to. Um, it was kind of inconvenient because I was traveling a lot and she was like, it's fine, you don't have to. Um, and I don't really get nauseous, I just get tired. So yeah, and then in between those um, couple of years of being on methotrexate, I made myself go into remission, kind of like Paulina. I went off of it myself. I was like, I can do this, I can do the natural route, I'm doing it. I did it without telling my rheumatologist. Um, I weaned off it correctly. I did it within a couple months. And then I went in and I was like, I'm on zero pills. And they were like, mm -mm, this isn't good. And then three months later, it came back. So <laughs> that's my story. And I'm still on 10 pills a week. Um, and yeah, I handle it well. That's me. Yay. Thank you for sharing. I'm so glad the pills worked for you. And wow, it, that's 10 pills. I love all the consistency. and. It sounds like it is definitely more convenient to how you were living at the time. Does anyone have questions for Ali? I have a question. Have you always done videos of you injecting yourself, I guess with your other medicine, but we, I think that would be something for people who are, haven't followed you to know about that you do entertaining videos of your medication delivery. Yeah. Yeah, so um, like she was saying, I'm on Enbrel, which is an injection, it's a biologic, and I, I've been on it for a year, and for those that are afraid to do injections, I too was very afraid, and so because of that, I started filming myself. Every single injection, I film myself, or I go live on Instagram, <laughs> and it's been like this for a whole year, because I feel like it's more fun to do it with people around. Um, it also gives me the confidence, and like Paulina, I did it with my nurse for the first time, and it is a little scary to do it yourself. So if you make it fun and entertaining, <laughs> it's actually a lot better. And I really encourage you to do it with someone. Don't do it alone. If you, I mean, I know it's COVID and you know, you have to, but if you can just like get on here and get on zoom, or if you want us to get on zoom with you, like having someone there with you to make it fun, also music, um, it really, really helps the nerves. So that's my advice. <laughs> Yay, thank you. Yes, making it fun definitely helps um, Helps it be a little bit easier. Um, all right, uh, Ananthi, would you like to go ahead? Sure, yes. So I started getting symptoms beginning of this year and it started off with my knees and my feet and I was the first person to blame the gym. I was like, it's exercise. Um, Nothing good comes from exercise. Um, it's got to be that. So, yes, so I thought it was that. Um, as part of my work, I then had to go for a conference. And on the night of the, the night before I was due to go, the conference was in London, I had to take the train. I felt like I'd sprained my wrist, but I don't know, I didn't do anything to make my, sprain my wrist. So I strapped it all up and everything and did what I would put I strapped it up. The next day, the wrist pain had completely vanished, but the shoulder was completely gone. And I was like, what is going on? I still had to go to this conference. I went and it just, it was just like it was, my joints were on a rotor. That is the only way I can explain it. They were just taking their own, own turn. It's like, oh, it's my turn now. I'm gonna hurt you. I'm gonna hurt you. And it just went from, I would say neck down. I was in pain. My head was fine. So, um, in the end, I decided to go to the doctor because that's just wise. Um, immediately, they had blood tests and everything. I was one of the lucky ones in the sense that my rheumatoid factor was positive. So I didn't really have to argue with what it may or may not be. However, that blood test result came at the end of March. I was given an appointment the 3rd of April, which promptly got cancelled because of COVID. So the hospitals were just shut, basically, all the outpatients, everything. And so I was left to my own devices. So I'm the kind of person that, number one, I'm allergic to ibuprofen and the anti-inflammatories, not ideal. So paracetamol was my friend. To be honest, didn't really touch the sides with the pain, but I'm also not a medication taker. So 
it it probably did its thing but i managed to i took paracetamol once a day that's that's what i did um but that that's just me i just power through and i was go, going like the other girls have mentioned i was going via the natural route of like turmeric and omega-3s and everything but seeing on the internet for a while oh it's going to take eight to twelve weeks to work but i had everything was out of my control i had to just wait for my appointment um in the meantime do what everyone else does turn to professor google the difference is my background is science i'm a biologist so i come from an angle where i know a little bit more and that's not necessarily a good thing. So during my PhD, um, I was working with these cells. These are like gut cells. And these cells, to make them do what I needed them to do, I added methotrexate to them. So I was physically watching these cells change, not necessarily in a good way. I was watching it through the microscope and I was sitting there reading on Google, the treatment for RA is methotrexate. So yeah it was um to to accept that i may need this was not easy so again going through the natural route paracetamol omega-3s and everything and i think it got to so this was from april it got to about mid-may when my body was not giving i was struggling to walk for more than 10 minutes at a time squeezing toothpaste took two hands you know it's like when when it's got to that kind of level you're like okay i need the help it's gonna have to be whatever the doctor gives me i will take it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be long term but i will take it and so i came to that acceptance and finally got seen two weeks ago and lo and behold i was given a methotrexate straight away along with the steroids because of course methotrexate takes its time to work so i've been given prednisolone um yes to start with and then to wean myself off over a six week period and methotrexate 15 milligrams so i've taken two doses again it was more the fear factor beforehand um but it wasn't so bad it was i started getting a little bit queasy on saturday night but it it was like half ten so I went to bed and I woke up and I was fine. And yeah, I've, I've been ab absolutely fine this time. Actually, last week I had a headache, this time absolutely fine. So um, water's been my friend. Um, I've noticed Cheryl had a question, so. I'm, so I have actually never tried the natural route because, and I'm, I'm just always curious when people do, and especially as a scientist, because for me, the evidence is so much stronger for the Western medicine, like that it can slow. Cause I do remember my doctors telling me like these medicines w are, are, you know, 75% of the time guaranteed to slow down disease progression and give you the best chance of lifelong function and lack of, of disability. So um, I'm just curious when people like, I see the diet and the natural route as risky, more risky than the medicine. But I know I'm like weird for that because it's so common for everyone else to not to not want the medicine. So I don't know what is, what is different about my brain. But for you as a scientist, did you look at the data for methotrexate's effectiveness, or were, or is it more just the knowledge of why methotrexate, how methotrexate interferes with cell metabolism, and like that is like fundamentally scary yeah it was more the fear factor behind methotrexate of what it's physically doing to cells because even though it's a strange one because at large doses it's chemotherapy but at small doses it can cause cancer so there is that mm. there is that kind of thing whereas i've been in a strange situation for myself where i've I've had cancer, I've had ovarian cancer. I didn't, I, but I didn't have chemo. See what I mean about not being a medicine taker. I had operations to remove it. I was offered chemo, but then I said, prove to me that it's still there and prove to me that the chemo is gonna give me an extra benefit. They couldn't, I didn't take it, I'm fine. So touch wood, all the wood. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's with, yeah, with methotrexate, it's, Obviously, the benefits far outweigh the cons. Um, from a natural point of view, 
everyone can be a cynic. Um, the research is pretty good for the Amiga 3s, which is why I went there. And also, from a personal observation, whilst I was on my own without seeing the doctor, I was struggling from a pain point of view, but I was also losing a lot of weight as well. So I think I lost um, about 14, 14, 15 pounds Ooh. over about a week period. Um, but then once the, well, I feel the only thing that I was taking that could have helped me was changing my diet a little bit and taking the omega threes and the turmeric, well, not even a supplement, I was having it as a drink, but my weight then went up another three pounds. And I feel like that may have been influenced somewhat by that. I don't know. There's no other explanation for it, really. So, but yeah, obviously I've um, succumbed to the medication. And, oh, and I'm sorry, and I, did, I, I did not mean to be like putting you, I realize now that I didn't mean to be putting you on the spot to like defend your choice to go natural. I, I was prompting that question only because I th it's such a common um, question people have I and mean, we could do like an eight hour long panel about and I and I've, I've gone to a naturopath and I have experiment you know in the last 17 years I, I was just thinking back to when I was first put on like it didn't even enter my mind to try anything else just because I, I guess I think I was probably just extremely desperate and I had lost 25 pounds on like a very small mm -hmm. frame so I feel I mean that's a terrible experience um there's something i didn't even know until i started researching it later called rheumatoid cachexia which is severe weight loss caused by uncontrolled um, inflammation from rheumatoid arthritis it's like a thing and no one even explained that to me they just were like yeah your body's just kind of messed up now because you have ra and then it, anyway so i'm so i'm like throw the kitchen sink at it person i just <laughs> it makes me i i get scared for people when they throw the meds completely out the window for natural because I've seen just people who have then experienced joint, um, you know, side effects that they, they can't turn back the clock and then they wish they could. So it's a very complicated thing. So I did not mean to be put you on the spot. I was just curious, especially as a scientist, I thought that was kind of an interesting that. Oh, no, I, I, I didn't think it put me on the spot at all. Oh, no. good. Okay, I didn't mean, like, why did you do this? It's like, not what I meant. <laughs> no, not, not even. Okay, good. Okay, good. I, am, I respect everyone. Yeah. yeah, and I think Kristen in the chat did mention that you're right. There is no funding for natural research, which is something that I want to put in my fiancé's or like med school applications because I'm helping them with it. And the fact that there is no natural, like funding for natural research coming out of medical schools, like that's crazy. But like looking into more osteopathic schools, like I've actually found that they do have a more naturopathic approach at least. So maybe that's a tip, um, find an osteopathic medical practitioner around you. They might have more alternative options if you are looking to go without um, methotrexate or just another of the heavy, you know, medications. And then, um, I don't know who was next. Just to add one more thing. I don't think when it comes to the natural route, it's very, it, number one, lack of funding. And, but also I think a real big thing is, um, <laughs> um, Cheryl's just said she's going to look into Omega so this is good um, I'll get onto that in a second but yeah um, my point was that everyone reacts differently and with it's not as so textbook as conventional medication where you can more or less rely on that whereas with the natural medication what what works for someone may not work for someone else so mm -hmm. I think that's that's quite a difficult thing and that's why and whilst you're waiting for things to work, you could be doing yourself a, a fair bit of damage as well. So I think you've got to be quite open to a lot of things. Um, what I did find out when I was reading about the Omega-3, which I don't think many people know about, is that there are two different, well, actually there are three. There is Omega-3, Omega-6, and Omega-9s. But Omega-3 is the one that you need to focus on for anti-inflammatory. Um, if you have an imbalance of an Omega-6, Omega-3 mm -hmm. ratio, you end up being more inflammatory than anti-inflammatory, if that makes sense. So it's always worth looking at what foods, supplements, etc., are in omega-3. Um, and 
kind of making sure they outweigh what's in your omega-6 foods because it's kind of easier to get omega-6 but not so easy for omega-3. Thank you. That totally makes sense. And yeah, nutrition is such a key thing as well. Um, I think, thank you again for sharing. Is, and are there any more questions? Awesome. Um, can I, I don't know who was next. I think it was Joe. Okay, yeah. Um, so, uh, like I said, I was diagnosed when I was 19. Uh, that was in between my first year and second year um, at uni. Uh, I was all alone when I started getting symptoms, which is even more terrifying. Uh, and I'm originally from Romania, so I had to go back home um, for the summer holidays. Um, and I was telling my mom, you know, I'm unwell, everything hurts, I've tried a lot of painkillers, um, and nothing was doing anything for me. And she got me an appointment to a rheumatologist. Um, but, you know, she couldn't do much except send me for a lot of blood tests um, at the time. And I was seeing a lot more specialists um, to figure out what was going on with me. Um, it took about three months uh, for it to come back as rheumatoid arthritis because they were unsure between that and lupus. Um, and to be honest, I don't remember much from that time except that when they gave me prednisone because the pain got so bad i just had the most amazing nap um uh, but that's about it and they told me about metatrexate um but my mom is very much uh the natural way person um and like um i forgot to mention but the same as ananthi i am a biologist so I know a bit more about what's going on, but it's not always good. Um, but very much at that time, um, my mom was kind of controlling what I was taking. Uh, and she said, you know what, we're gonna try the natural way first and then go from there. So that's why I didn't start my metotrexate until the following year. And um, so I did genetics as my undergrad and in my second year, everyone's favorite condition was rheumatoid arthritis. And it was terrifying how much they were talking about it uh, and all of these treatments. Um, and I thought, you know, I have, to, I have to do something because I had almost no mobility in my right hand. And that was a very helpful <laughs> university because I couldn't type or write or cook or brush my hair. Um, but yeah. Uh, I finally got up an appointment with the rheumatologist here in the UK uh, and they put me on the metotrexate pills. Uh, I think it was 20 milligrams at that time, um, but I just wasn't tolerating them well. Uh, they made me super nauseous, um, very tired. I used to take them on a Sunday evening and I remember on Mondays I could almost never go to uni because they made me so sick. Um, yeah, I was really scared of the injections because I was a bit of a, uh, I had a bit of a phobia, but after having to do a lot of blood tests, it kind of went away. Um, but I was a bit apprehensive when they suggested the injection again, but I thought, you know, it does absorb, your body does absorb it better um, in the injection form. So it was worth giving it a shot, especially if it gave me less um, side effects. Um, but I was really scared. I think I was with a nurse and it took me about an hour just to inject myself. And I was really embarrassed at that time because uh, it seemed like a waste of her time. Um, but yeah, I was tolerating the injection much better. Um, I quickly became a pro at it. Um, but yeah, so except the metotrexate, I'm also on sulfasalazine um, and I I used to be on hydroxychloroquine as well, but that made me really unstable. So they, uh, they got me off it. Um, I think that's about it. Yay, thank you so much. I've actually met very few people who are also on sulfasalazine because I guess there are more like older treatments according to some live health doctor I was talking to, but it 
it does work for me with the combo. Um, thank you. Are there any questions, you guys? Awesome. Thank you for sharing. Um, so I had said I would go next. And I think my story is also like everybody. It is a saga. Um, so I've basically had symptoms since I was 14 years old. I, it, I first started in my wrist. It was a bone that was sticking out. We went to the ER. I wasn't insured. And we had immigrated to America about three years ago so we obviously didn't have insurance or anything so getting diagnosis not even in the question they basically threw a splint on it told me to go look at it get it checked out by an orthopedic surgeon and no orthopedic surgeon around my area would see me without insurance because of liability concerns um so basically never got diagnosed and then I had a lot of pain all throughout high school and a lot of, I don't know, just a lot of pain all throughout college as well. And I started powerlifting in college. So when I started having a lot of pain again, I was like, oh my gosh, it's because I'm working out. Um, and I was totally blaming the gym. I had actually won a competition in third place. So I was really excited and to keep going. But then... I got scared that I was ruining my body. So I stopped and everyone was like, oh yeah, it is definitely your working out that's causing you to be so much pain. And I don't know, ever since I quit, I had, I started hurting even more because it was actually helping my circulation, getting the exercise I needed. Um, so basically things got a lot worse where I was working at a senior living and I was on my foot feet all day. Mm -hmm. I got put on methotrexate a year and a half after I was in my worst flare. Um, since then, I've had so much cartilage damage in my left ankle and toe. Mm -hmm. The bones basically now grind against each other. Um, so that's, that, that's damage that I can never get back. Um, like that's cartilage that I can never get back and that damage is going to be there forever. So basically I still limp all the time and I didn't think methotrexate was doing anything for me until I went off of it two months ago. And since then my entire body is flaring. I don't know what is going on. You guys, my hands, my wrists, my elbows, knees, hips neck uh although my doctor said it doesn't affect the neck but i can definitely feel something in my neck um and my jaw as well as having some inflammation i notice so i don't know i don't know if um anyone else had that experience with your jaw um and then my side of you as well thank you yay i'm not the only one <laughs> So I actually stopped chewing gum because I thought that's what was causing my jaw pain. Um, but no, guys, it was not. Um, anyway, so I, my side effects with methotrexate are so bad. Yes, yeah, see, yay, everyone agrees jaw is evil. I don't feel alone. And that's why I like love this community. I just, I never knew anybody else's mouth hurt. I thought that was me because I talk so much. But um, I have really bad side effects. Ooh, thanks, Cheryl. That's really interesting. A tiny joint in my throat. I wonder if that's that's ever been an issue for me. That's interesting. Thank you for sharing. Um, for me, side effects from methotrexate are nausea, and my stomach hates me for it. But I've also had those symptoms going on since I haven't been on methotrexate for two months. So we're thinking now that it's probably an outside GI issue. I'm currently uninsured, so can't get that checked out. But um, my methotrexate, I, I can't get back on methotrexate fast enough. And I will never go off of it again unless I want to have children someday. So yeah, um, guys. That's my story. You guys have any questions? Awesome. 
anybody who would like to go next? Let's see. I think it's just Jenny and I left. I listen. Okay, I can go first. Um, so I was, I feel like my diagnosis story is very brief and I feel extremely full and lucky for that experience because I know that that's not necessarily typical in our community. My dad has rheumatoid arthritis and my mom has Sjogren's. So I'm a perfect combination of my parents. And I think that's actually why I knew what it was so quickly. Um, so I started my first like aha symptom that brought me to tears um, was my shoulder. It was my right shoulder. I woke up in the middle of the night with the most severe pain I've ever experienced in my life. Um, I was crying. I couldn't sleep the rest of the night. And I told my husband that morning that I had to go get it checked out. I was like, I don't know what I did. Um, I was rowing a lot at the time. So I blamed it on rowing, which rowing is like one of the most gentle exercises you can do for your shoulder. It's very low risk. Um, so that didn't make a whole lot of sense. But I went to the doctor and they were like, here, they did x-rays. Everything looked fine. They were like, here are some anti-inflammatories. Take these, put your shoulder in a sling and you'll be okay. Um, then like a week later, it shifted sides. And I was like, okay, this is not an injury. This is probably rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and so I went back to the, my general doctor um, and they ordered labs, just like the full gamut, testing for HIV, Lyme, just everything. Um, they got those results back. My rheumatoid factor was actually negative at the time, but I think it was my, um, I always get these confused, but I think it's like CRP. Does that sound familiar to people? Uh, that was high. And so some other things were off in my labs as well. So they sent me to a rheumatologist. Took four months to get into my rheumatologist. So I was just waiting and agonizing pain, but you know, such is life. Um, and by the time I got in to see my my rheumatologist, my rheumatoid factor had increased so high and it was off the charts at that point. So right then and there, I got diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis and Sjogren's. Um, and like I said, I was put on methotrexate 20 milligrams uh, that day. So I started my dosage two days after. Um, I was really nervous when I first started taking it just because I had seen my dad taking it. And while he tolerated it, he tolerated it well, but I mean, you know, he's in bed like the day after taking methotrexate with the fatigue um, and just, you know, not, it's not your normal life, right? And so that's one thing that I think I wasn't prepared for when I got diagnosed was not fully understanding or accepting that like things were going to have to change. This was not just going to be business as usual. I was going to have to grieve for kind of my former life and what I thought I was capable of doing um, was going to look a little bit different from here on out. Um, and so I'm still kind of dealing with that. I think I have my ups and downs. Um, I'm in my final year, hopefully, of my PhD program, um, and I've had to really change my pace a lot, um, and it's been tough, not going to lie. Um, but yeah, so I'm excited for my symptoms, um, but the side effects are definitely something that, you know, I wish it wasn't there, but unfortunately, that's not reality, so <laughs> grateful for the medications, not so grateful for the side effects. Thank you for sharing, Kristen, and I can agree with that more. There's just, I don't think there's any way we can really prepare for starting to mourn our old lives, and I think that's the biggest thing I've seen, especially in my household, just mourning our, like, former lives is the hardest part. Thank you for sharing. Does anybody have any questions for Kristen? Um. Hey. Kristen, I know that um, if you're comfortable talking about it, I know you've been experimenting with some other ways to like minimize some of the side effects like fatigue. Um, is that something you'd be wanting to share? Yeah, okay. yeah, I can definitely talk about it now that I have the data. <laughs> um, so let's see, I think it was four months ago, um, I had my a remote telehealth appointment with my rheumatologist and I was complaining about some of these symptoms that I was having. I was experiencing a high level of fatigue, chest pain, and um, what else? Brain fog, the, the lovely brain fog. Um, and she was kind of like, all right, is this 
you know, inflammation or is this a side effect of your medication? Let's get some data. And so I'm a board certified behavior analyst. So when you tell a board certified behavior analyst to get some data, we roll with it and we get excited. <laughs> so I made up some data sheets for myself and I started tracking my behavior. Um, about two weeks into tracking my data, I started taking CBD, um, just a uh, tincture. And um, I decided to kind of see like, all right, what kinds of effects might the CBD have for my particular symptoms and my behavior? Um, so I took CBD for an entire month while taking data on my symptoms every single day. Then I removed the CBD for an entire month um, while taking data every single day. So I now have about three months worth of data, both with CBD and without. And since then, I've been able to analyze the data. I just did that this weekend, and it was super exciting um, because what I saw that the conditional probability of my fatigue and my brain fog symptoms was higher when I was not on CBD. So CBD actually decreased my likelihood of feeling some of those symptoms that we commonly feel from you know, methotrexate, that fatigue, that brain fog, I'm much more likely to feel a lot better when I'm taking CBD regularly. Um, so that was really exciting to me. And it was a nice way for me to justify that extra cost because CBD is expensive, which is why I wanted to do a treatment evaluation on it. I was not trying to spend that money. Um, we already spend so much, y'all, like on <laughs> different tests, and different treatments. Um, I did not want to add something into my regimen unless I knew that there was data to back it up. So it turns out there is, which is great, but also like, darn, I have to spend that extra money, but it's okay because I'll feel better. Um, so I'm excited to share that uh, data, those data with my rheumatologist when I see her again next month. Yay. Oh my gosh, that is super cool. I love that data and I, we talked about it yesterday about behavior and advocacy with that. I think what I've used behavioral analysis on myself, I am just a RBT. I worked with kids on the autism spectrum before, and I want to be a BCBA and have a PhD, just like Kristen, which is like, what? And it totally blew my mind the other day, but I love how passionate you are and that you're bringing it to chronic illness world. I know it will help. And definitely with the CBD, I think I'm lucky to have family members who actually sell them as a business so I do get them at like cost price which I do appreciate it is such a huge expense thank you for sharing uh Jenny would you like to go ahead sorry I'm on my phone so it's kind of weird um but kind of like for Kristen I have I've had psoriasis since I was 12 um, so they've been watching my joints for a long time just to see if it would come on um, because it's kind of an expected thing um, but I had a scare two years before I actually had the real arthritis kind of my wrist started to get a little sore um, so they checked me out for like the CRP which measures inflammation and they checked rheumatoid factor and everything and it was negative um, so two years from that, then we kind of just let it go and it wasn't anything. Um, and then last year, I think it was uh, sometime around then, um, I started doing HIIT workouts. So sprinting and running really fast and doing that type of, type of thing um, in the U.S. I don't know if Orange Theory is a thing everywhere, but it's a high intensity interval training um, workout program. So I was doing that about five times a week and um, really got into it. And in the summer of last year, around August of last year, I started to have some hip pain um, while I was running. And I had a running buddy that we would um, try to, you know, compete with each other. And eventually I couldn't keep up with him. And I was kind of, I started, I remember being like, my hips just feel really like weird. It feels like I'm like rusty or like, it's like, I'm like the tin man and I can't get myself to, to go as fast as I was going before. Um, so I went to the doctor immediately with that and she noticed in my toes. So psoriatic arthritis is kind of weird because it affects some joints and not other joints and it's not really on both sides of the body and it's, it's kind of weird. Um, but she noticed that my toes were swollen, um, kind of, they call it like sausage, like looking toes. Um, so she kind of found that and was like, you know what, this seems like it's psoriatic arthritis. So immediately, um, we, she got me into the rheumatologist and it was going to be a, like a six month wait, but then somebody got 
somebody canceled their appointment and they called me and I got in right away. Um, they, I, um, the first thing with, um, psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis is not actually methotrexate. It's Otesla is what they wanted to put me on before. So immediately I started Otesla and that's kind of a newer medication that is specific to psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis. Um, it worked okay. And for a little while I felt like I was getting, getting better. Um, I started to like jog again. Um, and then I'm also a nurse, so I started working more rotating schedules. For a long time, I was just doing day shift, but from the needs of the floor, it cut, moved around. I started working night shift, and the night shift actually really messed with my body and made my joints hurt so much more. Um, I was limping every day. It was, and it would, I would only work a night shift Friday, Saturday, every four weeks. Um, but the way that it would happen is I'd work my night shifts, and then it would take those three weeks to heal from the night shift and then I'd work it again and it would take those three weeks so I was never feeling okay. Um, so then I worked with my um, employer and we made it so that I could work during the day and that helped a little bit but it's still not great and so this is where the step comes where I start moving to methotrexate and uh, like a lot of people on here I'm a nurse and I know a little bit more and sometimes that's not always a great thing. Um, I'm an oncology nurse specifically so I see the side effects of the 300 milligram methotrexate and I see more of the extremes and it's not a great thing because I was talking to my rheumatologist and they love this drug and they you know they're like this is it's not something that you have to fear it's something that you have to respect because it is going to have some side effects but it's it's the safest thing that we that we know right now and the most effective to keep your joints healthy and safe and um, I think that along with the natural stuff what people were talking about with um, sometimes maybe the I know there's not a lot of research with that but I think for me sometimes fear can distort our um, like our idea of what is safe and what's not safe so it's not necessarily rational that we're more comfortable with the natural stuff but it is natural and so sometimes I think we're like okay well our bodies are natural and natural things must be good and scientific things that can cause cancer later on might not be good and I think it's not necessarily the fact that we don't know that the methotrexate is good and that it will help it's the fact that it's scary and so fear makes us irrational so yeah thank yeah. you Jenny. yeah that's yeah I read that on your profile when you shared your doctor's name not to be feared you have to respect it Ugh, yeah that was music to my ears um, <laughs> definitely, definitely. To respect it thank you so much for sharing are there any yeah questions? yay okay so um i feel like a lot of what you guys have said is you know we've covered a lot of advice too um, but I wanted to go ahead and do some advice pieces for injections. Um, does everybody do, if, if everyone is on injections, are you guys planning on doing it yourself or um, do you already do it on yourself or does a partner help you? Um, for me, Romy does my injections. I, I'm just honestly too scared. I watch him every second as that needle is going in, but I, I, I can't be the one holding the needle and like sticking it. I've even tried to find auto injectors for methotrexate, but those were $745 for like two little things. And uh, there's no way my insurance would pay for it and I can't pay for it. So I just have Romy do it and it makes it so much easier for me. Um, that he is doing it. He was also an EMT and he wants to be an orthopedic surgeon. So it's basically like practice for him to be able to stick me with needles. Um, does anybody have advice just specifically for the needles if you haven't shared it? Oh, go ahead, Jenny. Okay. I'm not on any injections and stuff and I haven't obviously started the methotrexate yet, but as a nurse, I can say that I, when I'm giving an injection to a patient, it's easy, it, it feels better, I think, if you pinch harder than the poke. I always tell them that. So if you can pinch harder with your fingers, then what the needle is going to feel like, it kind of tricks your brain into thinking that it focuses on the pinch more than the poke, basically. So anything you can do to kind of trick your brain. I love that. I also love using an ice cube to numb the area that my, my nurse told me that she could, I think she could feel how much I was sweating sitting in my office that day. 
but but the ice cube thing i haven't had to try that yet um some i've gotten shots before by other people um just like regular shots and i get bruising really hard so i i use ice on those when i know it's going to bruise but i've never had bruising in my tummy or thigh which is where i usually do my injection um any so if your partner or family member do ever end up being the ones to give you an injection this is my advice for them um don't take too long just go like swift and easy like swift like a cat just swift like a cat and i tell romy that every time before he sticks me even though he's really good i just it makes me feel better to say it and it makes me laugh and not think about what's about to happen so yeah um that helps and does anybody else have injection tips i know ali said to make it fun and that really helps <laughs> i think um this is going to sound really counterintuitive but something that i've learned that applies to any um dis uncomfortable situation something like for me i have anxiety not around needles but around um like claustrophobia i really really don't like like i've got i've gotten some mris it's really really hard for me and I think, um, so I'm, I'm looking at this from like an anxiety lens. So if you're having anxiety about anything, whether it's a needle or whatnot, um, the, I, what your brain usually was telling you is make it better, like get, decrease the anxiety, make it better, like take a deep breath or do this. But there's this, this, and Kristen can probably explain this better than I can, but I learned this different technique called acceptance and commitment therapy, which is the one that's worked the best for my anxiety. It's like diet, right? Like mental therapy things are like diet where this one that works for one person might not work for another, but um, mm -hmm. it's where you accept that it's going to feel bad. And you don't try to say, like you just say, whatever is happening in the moment, I can sit in the moment. I can sit like in this, for me, the MRI is like a really hard thing. So I'm like, I don't like this. I, I'm not able to control right now what's going on. And yeah. I'm accepting that. I can sit with it. I can tolerate it. And like making tolerance your goal rather than like feeling better or feeling great. It's like almost like reverse psychology sometimes where you're like, okay, feel worse. And they're like, oh, I actually don't feel as bad versus like feel better, feel better, feel better. Mm -hmm. So that's been like a really interesting and there's, there's a really interesting approach. Um, and I know it, it can work on anxiety. The, there's evidence for it working on anxiety and specific phobias, which needle phobia would be included in that. So okay. yeah. Yeah, I definitely can see that. Yeah, just to piggyback off of that, so acceptance and commitment therapy, so it's a psychotherapeutic technique that's actually rooted in behavior analysis, um, and it's extremely effective for a variety of things like anxiety, um, chronic pain even, um, and yeah, the whole idea is kind of like, life sucks, and that's it. <laughs> There's no need to try to change it, because this is just reality, and this is just how it is, and the sooner you accept that, the sooner it gets easier. Um, so I just want to plug, you know, I don't do injections for methotrexate, but I do Humira injections. Um, you know, I think that there is no shame in needing help. So if you're noticing that you're having a really hard time injecting yourself or you don't have somebody to help you, if you're spending more than 10 minutes doing the injection, it may be time to ask a therapist for help. There is no shame in that. Therapists exist for a reason. Um, and I absolutely think that you will, your future self will thank you for asking for help. I agree. Um, and also if you don't feel safe doing it yourself, my hand spasm, I throw my phone, oranges, everything. I throw everything on the ground out of nowhere. So for me, holding that needle is terrifying because I know I will spasm. So if you're, if you don't feel safe, I know there are insurance plans and governmental assistance, at least in the United States and California, that will provide you home health nurse to come support you with your injections. You just have to tell your doctor that. Um, she did offer that to me as well because I was, I did tell her, that, well, I can't give myself an injection every time. Can I have him do it and learn it? So it worked out for me that I have somebody. Um, and my sister-in-law knows as well, just in case Romy's not available to do it that time, so she can do it. Um, and I'm sure I'd be able to also. It's just 
makes me feel better having somebody else do it. And I love that everyone is so different because it just goes to show that nobody's going to have the same experience. Um, and thank you everyone for sharing. Is there, I just wanted to open it up so we could talk and just kind of have more of a natural discussion now that we kind of know a little bit about each other and all of our information. And it, again, if you guys have to hop off, feel free um, to do so. Um, one more thing I say to do is to spoil yourself after you do an injection. Um, give yourself a treat because you freaking deserve it. So, I mean, before I started injections, every time I had a doctor's appointment, which was constantly, I had to get blood work done and I got myself some Starbucks because I was like, you know what, girl, you deserve this. So now after I inject, I go get like some chocolate or I go make my own latte because we deserve it. So that's my advice. <laughs> Yay. Yes. I love that one. All right. I think to touch on just some more of the fears for people who are just starting, because um, I don't know if I mentioned that, that sort of the things that I've been scared of. Um, once I got over the fact of the whole, okay, I'm going to start methotrexate, this is where we're going with it, accepted that. Um, I think another fear is the hangover a little bit more, um, that the next day, like if you have a work schedule that you can't guarantee that you're going to have a day off to recover or you can't guarantee that you're not going to have to go through your daily motions um you know with feeling like that i think that was a fear um and the just more of like the side effects stuff i think a lot of people are afraid of that um but i like how we, a lot of people touched on the hangover part of it is not the same for everybody and maybe what is another good thing to think about is to treat yourself on that hangover day too, even if you have to work, but you know, doing something nice for yourself or, um, I don't know, something to that effect, because I think that the side effects and the, I think the fear of it is worse than the thing. It's the actual thing itself. So until you start it and I'm still in this space of having not started it yet, but until you start it, I feel like you build this thing up to be bigger than it actually is. So if anybody watching this is feeling that also, it's okay. <laughs> because I think that's the biggest thing is that all these things that we talk about, the fears of it are worse in your head than they are in the real life. So. I definitely would agree with that. Uh, my fears of methotrexate going in were totally different. I do have crazy amount of hair loss and some months like I, I don't have hair loss at all, but some months I have hair loss like crazy. It really depends so much on what, uh, what other things you're doing in your life. If you are able to take the day off the next day, great. But my methotrexate hangover doesn't kick in until the methotrexate is almost out of my system, which is about five days after my injection. Then my fatigue... <laughs> So methotrexate actually gives me a ton of energy, um, but it also gives me nausea and hair loss. That's my thing. Yeah. But if I just eat bland foods the next day, I can basically get through the next five days. So me, I take my methotrexate on Sunday or Monday so I can get through the whole week and rest on the weekend and then recharge again. Also, taking it right before you go to bed might help with the fatigue part because you'll naturally sleep it off, I guess. That's kind of how my doctor explained it to me. I usually do it in the morning. That way I can be pampered all day long. And I can be like, well, I got my injection today. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Allie. Yeah. And I just love it. I love having people just be at my, you know, um, beck and call. Just, can I have some water? <laughs> I'm a princess. I'm the worst. You are not. You are worth it. Thank you. That's what yeah. I said. <laughs> yeah. I love all these ideas. I mean, the only other thing is to know that however, however it starts is not, sorry, not the only other thing. The only thing I have to say, I'm sure all you brilliant people have more things to say, um, is like remembering that you can always mix things up later. And I think one of the things a lot of us struggle with is overwhelm, right? So even me having this for 17 years and being on, I'm on my third biologic and I've had a lot of things you know, happening in between. And um, it's like, it can sometimes feel like 
I, I joke with my doctor and my therapist, like a butterfly flapped its wings in Africa. And then that changed, like, you know, that thing with like, if a butterfly flaps its wings in Africa, like the weather changes where you are, it's like, well, a butterfly flapped its wings and now my left pinky hurts. Like I have no idea. But if you do start, like Kristen is a big, you know, real hardcore data collector, I've been able to kind of get away with not being as perfectly maybe um, a, of a data collector, but you can kind of start saying, okay, I'm going to start it at night and see how I feel the next two days and kind of just briefly journal about that and then try it on the morning the other time. And then just, you, could, you actually it can start feeling really empowered by the idea that, oh, I'm kind of in charge of tweaking things. And um, yeah, so I think that that, that can be really useful. Um, yeah, and, and I think that's, oh yeah, the other thing is scheduling. I do because uh, I, I don't seem to have the severe fatigue a lot of people experience, but um, I, I do feel a bit tired the next day. Like, and I'm just used to feeling tired at this point, but um, I've started taking it closer to the weekend, like Thursday night. Um, and oh, I was going to say something else. I forgot. Okay. never mind. <laughs> the brain fog. Oh, that's actually what, okay. What I was going to say. So in the last 17 years, the best I've ever felt that entire time was when I was pregnant. And, um, so when you're pregnant, some, some people, not everyone with autoimmune diseases, it goes into remission. But the thing that stood out for me was not only did my physical symptoms go into remission, I felt more energy than I had felt in a long time. And then I realized, wait, so if I've been on methotrexate this whole time, at a certain point, you just accommodate to it. And you're like, this is what my, this is what I feel like. Like, this is who I, like, this is my body, right? So I actually, since I haven't been off of it other than pregnancy, I actually don't know how much fatigue I have. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I, it may be causing, and not necessarily a distinct hangover the next day, but it may be just causing this baseline level of fatigue that, because I mean, a lot, it's, pregnancy is notorious for causing fatigue. And I was like, Woohoo! Party time! Like I flew to China to visit my husband. I went to Japan. We went traveled. We like walked all around the Great Wall. I, I was going swing dancing. I was like, I've never felt better. Um, so it is. There is a certain point. Like I know sometimes my doctor has been like, "Well, do you think this is happening or is this?" And I'm like, I literally don't ever completely know unless I go off of something whether what's causing what unless it's like severe. Like when I I did start on a medication for anxiety and I had. Unfortunately, it's a very effective medication and it works really well for my anxiety, but they're kind of SSRIs are kind of notorious for having that two to three week, like, oh, it's like hard to get your brain is like spasming, like, and you're like, whoa, I feel weird. Like I feel like I am, this is very distinct. If it's not like a severe side effect, you get to this point where it's just hard to know yet yeah, trial and error, like what is causing what? So anyway for whatever that's worth. <laughs> there was a point in there somewhere. <laughs> well, I love it. Yeah. I, I, like everything, I think trial and error is the key to finding what works for you because what works for me is not going to necessarily work for Cheryl or for Paulina or anybody else on here. And I'm sure we can all say and relate like, yes, I have that same symptom and everything, but just being able to keep going and just keep trying new things. Paulina, did you want to go ahead with your comment and tip? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, actually, just a second and sort of add a little bit more on acceptance and fear. One thing that has been helping me, but of course we have our good days and we have our bad days. What's been helping me a lot mentally is trying to stay in the moment and accepting what is now. I am someone who, or I used to be, I try to not go in that route anymore, but I used to be someone who would just think a year ahead or a month ahead or five years ahead or 20 years ahead. And I'm like, wait, this is going to get so much worse. This is just, I'm just going to continue and this is going to get this and that I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm a dancer as well. So I'm like, well, I'm not going to be able to dance at one point in my life. And what am I going to do? And I continuously found myself going into a spiral and I mean stress and all of this it really doesn't help us and something that I try to do on a regular basis is to simply stay in the moment and accept that today at nine o'clock is how I'm feeling and today at six o'clock it's how I'm feeling and that's how it is because every single hour 
could be completely different. And just because I woke up this way doesn't mean I'll go to sleep feeling that way. So I mean, it's hard. I'm not saying this is like, hey, you can do that. It's continuous work every single day to just try to like look and, and accept that this is how I feel in this moment. And it's fine to say no to someone that I made friends with for tomorrow, with a plan to meet with for tomorrow. When actually I wake up feeling shitty, I'm like, well, sorry, I cannot go. Yesterday I felt amazing, but today I don't, and that's fine. And I feel that finding that balance and finding that acceptance to be okay with how we're feeling in that specific moment has been such a massive changer for me because, I mean, there truly is no point looking at the future, even if it's a future in one hour or two hours ahead, because we can't change it, what's going to happen. We can't influence it as such, like properly. I mean, we can sort of keep our spoons from tomorrow for today, but we still have to just accept what's coming and like what's, what's happening in that moment that we're in right now. Mm -hmm. And for something that maybe like helps me get into that is meditation, but guided meditation, because if you try to sit quietly, your mind is just going to go like, it's going to do its thing. You will never be able to not focus on what's on your mind guided meditation or moving meditation. Like I'm a dancer myself. So putting music on and doing dancing meditation, it's like, it, it transforms me <laughs> and my mind is elsewhere in that moment. And um, so that's something that helps. And also most of you probably know, but I'm into yoga a lot and I have been for a very long time. Now being actually, okay, a few moments from certifying, I can also say that that getting yourself into a point of finding what, like occupying your mind with balancing your body, for example, yoga poses where you have to focus and balance yourself brings you into the moment. Your mind will not think about what you have to do tomorrow because you're about to lift your foot up and you might fall if you don't focus on keeping balance. So actually that's been like such a huge help for me as well. On the days that I'm feeling like my mind is like thinking that I have made these plans in a week's time and they're really important for me and I want to be there, but oh my gosh, how will I feel? Then I just do a very challenging balancing yoga workout or yoga session to bring my mind back into the moment and sort of help myself accept that that's where I am. And that's what I need to focus on now. And whatever is going to come, I will deal with it when it's there, when the moment comes and go, same, go through the same process of just accepting, analyzing what you can and can't do and simply going with it. Yes. Thank you, Paulina. Yes. That is so important. Just seeing where you are in the moment and like being okay with it, I think is so important. And um, I, I love that you found something that you're so passionate about and it can like help you manage your day-to-day -day symptoms and like support other people and finding that same. I think it's awesome. Um, for me, balance is something I treasure, but can never find. Um, so I'm always trying to find ways to get that. Uh, is anyone else? Um, didn't see my chat. Yeah, anybody else that would like to um, say some stuff? I'll just mention, I think that stuff like with the meditation and kind of managing, managing the anxiety around things is especially important for um, people who are on methotrexate just because we are immunocompromised. If you, you know, that comes along with being on methotrexate. And I think the fact that we're in a pandemic right now really heightens that anxiety about um, starting the medication. And I know for me, that's a big reason too that I kind of like delayed it because I was kind of thinking like is this going to be safe for me to do right now in my head it was kind of like it goes against my gut to start something that's going to suppress my immune system during something that you'd have to have your immune system to fight it type of thing um something 
I don't know if it's helpful or not. Like what my rheumatologist kind of talked to me about with it was that um, some of the, your, I don't know if this will make sense and we can cut it out if we need to, but the fact like with the virus, it's such a um, spreadable virus, easily spreadable virus that it's not that being on methotrexate is going to severely increase your risk of getting it as much as anybody else. Like if you go out, um, but it's just what you do when, oh, sorry. But as far as how you're going to treat it when you get it and what you do with the medication. So she kind of explained it to me that even when people are getting this virus, they're using immune suppressant medication to kind of calm the immune system's response to the virus. And so it's not necessarily increasing your risk of getting this specific thing. It's just what you do with it when you get it and kind of how you manage from there. So I know that a lot of people, especially right now, are probably anxious because of the state of the world that we're in um, with starting. So that's something maybe we want to touch on too. I don't know. That's yeah. such a great yeah, point. And I just want to, that's beautifully said. And um, I wanted to give a shout out in case if you're brand, brand new, um, both the Arthritis Foundation, which is a nonprofit in the United States, and I'm guessing there's the Arthritis Society in UK, a lot of the foundations have been putting out really helpful information and data. And the same with the American College of Rheumatology and the European League Against Rheumatism. Those are the professional associations for like doctors and health professionals who work in rheumatology. And um, they have some of, they've been doing, some of them have been doing webinars and times where you can actually chat with a doctor. And so the evidence so far has been showing that we are not, if you don't have any other risk factors in addition to just the RA, if you all don't also have asthma or history of bronchitis or anything, that the outcomes aren't as bad as you would think, given that it's intrinsically immunosuppressive. So that's pretty, um, it can definitely assuage some of that fear, hopefully. But yeah, I, can, I can't imagine if I had got diagnosed today with all the increased access to data and the pandemic, I think it would definitely, I, I almost feel like ignorance was bliss in my case. Like not only did I not, I wasn't like a biologist, like half of you guys are like biologists. I was like, it's fine. Cause, and there, there actually is, there are conversations about this that I want to quickly mention that in, in the, cause I'm an occupational therapist. So I am a health professional now, but I wasn't when I got diagnosed, <laughs> but um, you know, there's a lot of discussions in the field about of, of uh, even in, in doctors um, circles talking about how these, um, the legal, what they legally have to tell you about side effects can kind of backfire because it's, they have to say it, it's like not weighted, right? So actually pregnancy is a good example. So in pregnancy, it's like, don't do these 30 things. Don't eat sushi, don't eat deli meat, don't eat, but there's never a delineation of what's more risky. Like is sushi more risky than, you know, deli meat. So it's the same with this. It's like, methotrexate can cause all this giant laundry list. And you're like, okay, but tell me the percentages. Like, was it 0.00001% that got cancer and then 70% have fatigue? That's a lot different than 70% get cancer and 1% get fatigue. So mm -hmm. anyway, a lot of doctors feel like it's, it, it's supposed, those are supposed to be there to protect patients because in the past pharmaceuticals were like, Hey, just take it. It's all fine. And then people mm -hmm. were like, I'm dying. What's happening. And then, but now they're like, okay, protect them, tell them everything bad that could happen. And then it's like meant to protect us, but it actually backfires because then people mm -hmm. are scared anyway. So there's probably some solution. <laughs> so um, if it helps at all to hear this, I, at the beginning of the shutdown, I called my doctor frantically because I was about to start a new job and I needed a vaccination for chicken pox. And my mom had told me, you have chicken pox, but my antibodies were like, you've never had chicken pox. So my doctor was more concerned about me being on methotrexate and not having antibodies for chicken pox than me being on methotrexate and possibly exposing myself to COVID. So if that helps, like, COVID and methotrexate as an immunosuppressive is not as big of a concern for my doctor, but like me being not immunized to chicken pox was like a huge thing for her. And she flipped out and said she could actually lose her license. Like if I had gotten sick because they're supposed to test for antibodies for certain things, if you don't have immunization. Um, and I didn't have immunization. I just, I had it as a child twice. So we thought that was maybe enough 
antibody buildup, but it clearly was not. So, or it could have been something else, but yeah. So I, I would really, um, you know, help with the anxiety. I feel like CBD is something that works for me in anxiety. It doesn't do anything for me for pain at all, topical or ingestion, but my anxiety is amazing with CBD products. So if you are, you know, feeling a little bit more anxious, I would suggest like trialing some of them as you experience methotrexate. But for the first two months for me, nothing really happened. I didn't really see how it was helping me until I was no longer taking it. So if you are someone who's been on methotrexate and you feel like it hasn't worked for you and you're just tired of the symptoms, you may feel very differently if you do go off of it. So just if medications haven't worked for you, like keep trying, you guys. Um, yeah, no problem. I, I have to get ready for my wedding today. So if you guys want to cut this short, I'm totally okay with that. <laughs> No, I just, I wanted to give a little warning. Yeah, I have about a little less than 20 minutes left if anyone wants to say, I'll stop talking. If anyone wants to say a last message that you didn't get a chance to say yet. <laughs> I'd like to go um, and then say something. For everyone out there, for anyone that comes across this video recording now or anything, there's a community now and you don't have to be alone. Like you can come to any of us or to any other person, Google or go on Instagram, check for a hashtag related to spoonies or chronic pain or arthritis or any condition that you have. And you'll be able to connect with so many people and just talk because sometimes all that we need is to just get it out of our chest because no one else in our family understands us fully. And we just need to get it out of our chest. We don't even need advice. We don't even need them to say anything. We just need to say it to someone who we know understands because they're going through something like that or something similar. So you're never alone. You have a huge community now that you can join and talk to. So please just approach people and say that you want to talk. Yay, thank you. Yes, it's so true. We're, we're all very talkative, I feel, and we're all super nice. I just, I never knew people could be this nice. And, and then I, I fell into this community. So, yay. All right, anybody else? Yeah, I'd like to say something if that's okay. Uh, so just like a general piece of advice uh, for everyone that is new to this and scared as we probably all were at the beginning of a diagnosis. Um, you just have to make sure that you make a decision about where you want to go treatment wise, um, you know, make it for yourself. And yeah, it's completely fine to listen to other people and other people's stories. But at the end of the day, you have to make up your own opinion and make sure that, you know, what you're about to do is the best for you. Um, Cause you know, you might have to do this I don't know for how long, so it might as well be confident in what you're doing. Um, and, you know, go all in um, based on your decision. Yes, go all in. I love that. Thank you. Okay, I am going to say one more thing. <laughs> I swear, I think I have ADD in my... Anyway, psychiatrist doesn't think I do. I'm like... Eh. <laughs> so... <laughs> um, I actually, because I, I, I want to full circle on this whole idea of natural medicine versus, versus Western. You don't have to choose one versus the other. It, it's often positioned as you have to either go all in on the natural and the Western meds are scary and eh, or you have to go all in on the Western and like, who cares about diet? You can do both, you know? And I know a lot of people who, yeah, they start, let's say, okay, I want to be as aggressive with this as possible because I am aware of some data that early aggressive treatment is the best for long-term, maybe joint damage um, prevention. But then you say, okay, I'm going to start like at 25 milligrams of methotrexate, and then I'm going to do all this amazing lifestyle, diet, exercise, and, and then I'm, you know, meditation, stress management, and then I'm going to see, oh, if I'm feeling amazing at 25 milligrams of methotrexate with all my lifestyle things, what if we can bump down the methotrexate to 20 milligrams, 15? And there's 
I've again been exposed to people who've done that too. So it's like have your cake and eat it too. So, and again, I didn't mean early. I know I'm like having this complex now. I didn't mean early to be like, why did you do it? Yeah, yeah. I was like, I'm just because I, I, I am curious when people, and then initially when people go all in on one or the other, it's, it's fascinating to me because, yeah, I went all in on the Western meds initially and then only kind of figured out the natural um, complementary stuff later. So, okay. People agree with me in the comments. So I'm feeling validated. No, yeah, I'm amazing. No. <laughs> no, both, I think We're all genius. Best. <laughs> both, I, I think I've got a slight, slight bit of advice for the newbies. As a newbie, if you're starting up a new profile and you're beginning your journey, you will find that there are certain people that slide in your DMs that claim that they've got the world's most amazing cure. Um, take it with a pinch of salt. I've had my polite days. I've had my very impolite days. Um, I would listen to the specialists and go with what they're, what they're saying. Yes, they're all saying a truckload of salt. Yes. Um, yes. I, pre I would prefer to put the salt on my food. <laughs> but, but, you know, um, yeah, it's a bit of crap, a lot of them. So I agree. And a lot of these things, they are not supposed to work with our medication. Um, and I know some of the products that have been like sent, I know some of the screenshots I've seen and I recognize it because I do use that company for some of my non-toxic things. And it makes me so angry when people suggest things without like looking at people's history or like what medications they're on because they kept suggesting me to do like this hormone therapy, but with my birth control, like I can't take that. And obviously like I had to do my own research and then be like, no thanks dude. Like, by so yes so much like so many people out there trying to like pass off cures and i have to keep telling my family as well like no that's not a cure that's just you wasting your money like there's no cure god can't like make this go away um and if you are spiritual for me what i told my mom was to pray for strength and courage to get through this so if you are religious and your family is religious Praying for a cure may not be realistic, but you can pray for strength and courage, and that might actually um, give you more hope. So maybe that's my last piece of advice. Just if your family is insisting on praying on you, let them and have them pray for things like courage and strength and acceptance. That's something I asked my mom to personally pray for, and it's helped, at least in a placebo way, it's helped me. <laughs> yeah, I love that. but. Um... And as we were saying, like, we will get a lot of DMs of people who are medicine shaming us, which as you know, if you follow me, I get a ton. And of course you can block them or you can try to explain to them, but what's harder is our family members and our significant others that are not on board. Mm -hmm. um, and so mine wasn't, I don't care what mine wasn't. So um, that's why I created my Instagram page. So bringing awareness to them. So now that my friends and family watch me and they see it every day, they're like, oh, wow, like that's what you're going through. So um, giving your family and friends like the resources, like if they want to check out our pages or if they want to follow along on our journeys and educating them and really sit down with them and let them know how they're making you feel is super important. Yay. Yeah. I, I agree with all of that. And one last sentence, because we just keep going over. Um, <laughs> We talk about like nutrition, we talk about exercise, talk about these little things that could, might, maybe help. No cure, no, um, like no claims or anything. However, what I would want to say is to not be afraid to try something new that might mm -hmm. help. It might just help mentally, it might be a placebo, it might just be with your stress or it might be with your pain management. But if it's not actually harming you, then don't be afraid to try it out because each of one, each one of us is so, so different that what's working for me not, might not work for you, but it could also work for you. Just give it a go and test it out and see how it feels. I thought you were going to say, try yoga. <laughs> well, I will say that too, yeah, but... No. It's not necessary. You guys all know that already. You know. Well, what's amazing is that we get suggested these things so often 
that sometimes you've got a knee jerk reaction against it. Like Alyssa, initially I was like, I don't want to do yoga because everyone keeps telling me to do yoga and it'll cure my RA and I'm mad at them. But now I'm like, wait a minute, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Like yoga could be amazing. And I try to, I, like, I like this. So yeah. Okay. We, had that, we had that conversation when me and Cheryl connected a few days ago. She was like, yeah, but Paulina, like people cure, like people claim that yoga can like cure their illness. What do you say to that? And I was like, hold on a minute. Okay, oh. it's not going to cure, but <laughs> you can help with this and that. And yeah, false advertisement out there, making people feel like, I think it puts people off, like claiming that it's going to cure, puts an automatic blockage on us. And it's like, no, I'm never going to try this because they said it's going to cure it. And I know 100% it's not going to. So like, just take it with a pinch of salt, what they're saying. They're probably saying it because, I don't know, maybe they're going through something or they need to say it for themselves. And we don't know everyone's stories. Everyone is going through different things. And just accept that, okay, makes them feel good to say that. But no, thank you. And I will try it out. I know it might not cure it, but I will try it out. I'll try this and see how it feels. But yeah, people making claims, I am very passionate about like putting my foot down on them. Yeah, I think it's important to note just one last thing as we kind of wrap this all up. Um, you're in charge of your journey. This is your journey. No one else's. If you want to try yoga, try yoga. If you don't want to try yoga, don't freaking try yoga. It is up to you because this is your journey and no one else's. And don't feel bad because you don't want to try something or because you do want to try something. This is your life and you're in charge. Yes, and being sick, everyone's always telling us what to do and what not to do. Man, it just makes me so crazy. So yes, try whatever you want. Don't try whatever you want. Lay in bed all day. Go running all day. It really doesn't matter because at the end of the day, if you're not happy living the life you have, then it's just... <laughs> oh my gosh my favorite ones are the herpes comments like someone help me cure my herpes and I'm like how did they do that that's just like so crazy you guys but I'm so glad we're like not the only ones getting all these messages I mean they're happening to everybody so <laughs> I mean, I think everyone is, the way I feel about it is the way I feel about religion. I'm like, everyone is welcome to give me their pitch once. And then if I tell you respectfully that like, I've listened to you, like I will listen to you because I believe, like, if I believe that everyone was going to hell if they didn't take an action, I would want, it would be like, it's an act of kindness to try to save people from going to hell, right? But yeah. because, I, but if I tell you like, I have different beliefs and I don't, we're not going to get anywhere with this conversation, but I will respectfully listen to you. And then the second, like after that first conversation, I'm like, I'm then I'm like, okay, I've listened to you. And then, you know, we can stop the conversation. I'm bad at stopping conversations. You might be surprised at that, <laughs> but I'm like, I'll listen to you once, you know, and then, then bye. 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 Ain't nobody got time for that. I agree. And this is so awesome, you guys. Thank you. We yes. are so wise, everyone. <laughs> I People should just know. pay us to listen to them or listen to us all day. <laughs> no, seriously, this is amazing. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. I hope you guys have a little bit more clarity going through your journey.